And today, today we have first aid extraordinaire. Whoops, I just like blanked myself out. <laughs> I totally like blanked my screen. We're having a lot of technical difficulties today here. Um, we have Jen, I'm never going to say her last name right. Your Burgoyne. Burgoyne. I knew it. I get all stressed out about people's last names. Hi, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> she's um, Courage Canine. And so she's a diverse individual of canine, um, just like everything canine that you can kind of think of it sounds like. But also she was a mounted patrol. She was a Canadian Mountie, which I had no idea, Jen. I was kind of excited when I saw that. Um, I've never met a Canadian Mountie. So obviously I have. And I didn't even know it. There you go. And, and so you've been doing first aid instruction for 15 years. Yes. Has has the first aid people that you've been with, Canadian first aid, or are you one of the founding members or was I that wanted, before that? Yeah, I was one of the first. Uh, groups of people that EquiHealth Canada um, actually trained to deliver the program. So they were, they had their program um, developed and they were teaching it. And I was one of the first ones who went through the training. And I was actually one of the originals that was then doing instructor training. So I started on the equine side within EquiHealth Canada. And then as the other programs came out, I got certified in them as well. So dogs have been part of my life for a long time. And it was just a natural transition going into the canine first aid. And then last year we added the feline first aid program as well. So feline first aid seems like an oxymoron a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like jumbo shrimp, right? So cats don't tend to hurt themselves too much, but when they do, I guess they really do it well. Yeah, Is it's um, a bit of a scary thing when we're faced with these types of emergencies. So um, I don't know what you're, I guess, kind of what you wanted to guide through tonight. I had like a couple little things. I don't know if I can even pop them up and share them presentation wise um, if you yeah. can let me hold on let me make you a um co-host and then that should give you access depending yeah, on and, and I will just chat while you try to pull up your slides and all of that mm -hmm. so so yes I, I guess what you're doing is first responding as well hey it worked look at that awesome. look I, at I that Best in my technology tonight. Woo. Yeah. So pet first aid is a growing um, industry because we are seeing some scary trends in terms of getting our dogs assistance. So I actually pulled some stats for you guys down in the States and they actually came back with 66% of households have a pet. So there's 65.1 million households with a dog, 46.5 million households with a cat. And people are spending a lot of money on their pets every year. And 97% of people who have pets consider them to be family members, wow. which is an interesting trend that we're, we're seeing. They're not seen as the work animal that we used to see in history. They are really part of people's families now. Um, interesting stat was three quarter of pet owners would pass on their dream home if it didn't accommodate their pet. So they're I would, really, I being, would, I yeah. totally would. <laughs> We're putting our pets way up there. But then the scary piece is this last statistic of 63% of pet owners could not afford a surprise vet bill. And the That's... dollar value they used for that was a surprise vet bill of between 500 and a thousand dollars. So That's 63 insane. of pet owners could not afford that or it would put them into financial distress if they had to, to deal with that type of a bill that came up. That's terrifying. It is. And, um, you know, for anybody that's taken their dogs to a vet and it's an emergency situation, it's usually going to be 
more than a $500 vet bill if it is an emergency type situation. This was the statistics from two years ago in the number of veterinarians there are in the US. So 127,131 veterinarians. So when you compare that to the number of pets there actually are, you have a not very many veterinarians taking care of a lot of pets. So the trend that we're seeing is it's not abnormal to wait two to three weeks for a regular vet appointment. You're booking two to three weeks out. And if you go to an emergency clinic, the average wait time is eight plus hours. That is true for California. Yeah, this is a trend we're seeing right across North America. It's it's really scary to see how long um, you have to wait, even in that an emergency situation. So knowing first aid is something that is becoming very much essential. Um, first aid is not a replacement for veterinary care. It is designed to supplement it. Uh, it's being able to assess if a situation is an emergency. So if it's not something that is an emergency, it can save you a little bit of money because then you're not running into the vet uh, every five minutes questioning if your pet's actually okay or not. Providing accurate information to your vet from the onset of symptoms can also help them diagnose getting your pet's treatment started sooner. So if you're able to actually do proper vital signs and know what you're looking for and give that accurate information to the vet, they're able to start diagnosing and figure out what's going on with your pet faster versus them taking the first set of information when you get in, waiting 30 minutes and taking it again to see are things spiking, are things dropping, are they stable? It, it allows them to speed up that process. Um, some emergencies also require immediate intervention, otherwise survival or a full recovery is unlikely for the dog. Um, and then knowing what to do helps you remain calmer. And I hear this a lot from people that have done our first aid classes, that they hope that they're never going to need it. But then when they are actually faced with an emergency, they almost always email back and they're like, you know what? I knew what to do. So I didn't panic. And That's just so that exciting. Little, yeah. That little bit of, they did it hands-on in a class. They know the steps that they need to take allows them to stay calm. So then they can actually assess what's going on and act. They don't freeze up because they're actually able to stay calm. This was just for fun. We all know the benefits of having dogs, right? They, they help us feel good. They provide us emotional support. <laughs> but there's, there is a lot of research out there that shows that people tend to be healthier when they have pets as well. So the benefits of having dogs and cats are pretty much the same. They're awesome. Um, I, I think everybody should have them in their lives for sure. <laughs> um, this is just kind of a, a reminder too that even in first aid, we start looking right down at the bottom at these physiological needs, right? We need to make sure that our dogs are healthy before we can even look at anything else of them feeling fulfilled in life. Um, this is making sure they've got proper food, nutrition, water, uh, exercise, mental stimulation. And then you can actually, uh, they'll move up the pyramid in terms of their needs being fulfilled in life. I've never seen this. You've never seen this? No. Oh, this and and for, I... like, people and animals and everything. Um, so the esteem factor uh -huh. I think that's really interesting. What does that mean to you? So this, this pyramid basically means you, even with people, you can't feel that you have self-esteem and confidence if you're lacking these things on the bottom. So if your physiological needs are not being met, you're not going to feel safe in life to begin with. Um, but once these are met, then you can work on your safety. And then the safety is, you know, feeling, you know, financially safe, feeling physically safe, feeling emotionally safe, all of that falls under your safety. Once you feel, once you're in that position that your safety needs are met, then you start to be able to experience the feelings of belonging and love. And once those are being met, then you actually reach true self-esteem. 
So people that have self-esteem um, issues or, or aren't really at that tier, often it's because something below here is missing. There's a gap somewhere in the lower part of that pyramid that is preventing you from being able to have self-esteem and being confident in yourself. That's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. That makes sense. I totally it's see myself like, in this. I'm like, oh. <laughs> are you like, where are you on that tier? And you know, it can fluctuate too, right? So for somebody who, you know, you've got the stable job, everything is great in your life. Well, if you suddenly lose your job and you can't financially provide for your family, you're now down, you popped all the way down to safety. You don't feel safe because you can't provide for your family, which impacts your ability to connect with people. Right. So then you don't have that sense of belonging because it's impacting your ability to connect with them, which also in turn makes you not be confident in yourself. It impacts your own self-esteem. So everything falls within this pyramid. We have to build from the bottom up and we do the same with our pets. We need to build them from the bottom up. That's awesome. Um, in first aid. One of the big take homes that we like to really get people thinking about is your priorities of action. This is for dogs, cats, um, doesn't really matter, but breathing is your first priority. So you want to make sure that the animal is breathing before you move on to anything else. And people see blood and they often focus on the blood. But if the animal isn't breathing, the bleeding doesn't matter, right? Because we got to get them breathing. Otherwise, it's not going to matter that they had they had blood loss. So we deal with our breathing emergencies first, then we move into our bleeding injuries. And after we've stopped, you know, clotted the bleeding and dealt with our bleeding, we then move into our body. And this is where we'll take an assessment of, do we see broken bones? Um, we'll take our vital signs so that we can get a baseline of knowing where our pet is right then in that emergency. And then we always start to treat for shock. So, um, so these first first steps that you should actually be doing with your pet before you even have to worry about first aid. So before I ever have to deal with an emergency, these are things that every pet owner should do. You should have a baseline so you know what's normal. What is your pet's regular breaths per minute? What is their regular heart rate? What is their temperature, their weight? What do their normal capillary refills look like? Uh, what does a hydration check look like for them? And then doing that whole nose to tail examination of going, you know, do they have a dry nose or a wet nose? Do they have goopy eyes? Do, you know, what is abnormal and normal for your pet? And you should actually be redoing those checks at least every four months throughout the year so that you can catch things before they become a clinical problem. I actually Thanks. had a girl in uh, one of my classes, she went home and I have this worksheet I send home with everybody in my classes. So she went home and she's doing this worksheet and I always tell them to send it to me afterwards because I love to see what's going on with their checks at home. And when I looked at the breaths per minute and the heart rate on her dog, I messaged her back and I was like, I, I think you should maybe make a vet appointment. And her instant reaction was, why, what's wrong? I'm like, well, I'm not a vet. I can't diagnose your dog. But if those are accurate, they're not normal. They're outside of the normal range. So you should consult your vet and see what's going on for your dog. She took her dog in the next day and they did a bunch of tests. And it turned out that the dog was in early stages of heart disease. So wow. the dog wasn't yet showing clinical signs that she was able to see and them catching it early allowed them to get the dog onto the proper medication before more damage was actually done in turn. That's, you know, that's amazing. And yeah. we should do this probably seasonally as the season. Every, yep. Every four months you should be rechecking all of your baseline vitals, doing that nose to tail examination and recording it somewhere so that you know, what's normal. Um, again, not every pet reads the book either. <laughs> I've got a, a dog myself that does not fall within the normal temperature range. So her temperature, her body temperature runs low. 
And if I didn't know that and I took her temperature because I thought she was having a funky day and it came back in the normal range, I might be like, oh, you're fine. You're in the normal range. Whereas for her, that would be a spike in temperature indicating that there's some type of infection. And I might miss that because I didn't have a baseline. So, so dogs, dogs, as well as humans, mm -hmm. when they run subnormal, they often have a chronic issue yeah sometimes like in her case she doesn't she I had her checked out like crazy when I found this and there's nothing that they've been able to find she's now nine years old and she's happy as can be and super healthy but her normal for her is just low wow so and, that's and what breed is she Jen she's an Australian Shepherd well that makes sense <laughs> she's that <not> normal <laughs> she, she, hyper energy crazy dog right <laughs> so, you would think she'd run hot you would think but no she runs low and that's just normal for her amazing and then the other things that we really like to encourage people for is training for treatment so can you touch your pet everywhere can you check inside their mouth can you flip them onto their back have you practiced different types of restraints and carries can you bandage all parts of their body um, for, you know, are they kennel trained and for dogs, are they muzzle trained? And I know a lot of people don't look at muzzle training as a necessity, but when it comes to first aid, this is something that can make a big difference in your dog receiving treatment because they are going to be in panic. They're going to, they're scared, they're hurt. And then you've got yourself or potentially other people trying to handle them. And there's a high chance of somebody getting bit. So people might back off and not actually do the care out of preservation for themselves. But if your dog is muzzle trained and comfortable wearing a muzzle, you pop a muzzle on and now you can safely work around that dog without that little idea in the back of your head going, I might get bit. I shouldn't do this. That's so smart. As you know, I've seen a lot of dogs that do not lay on their backs. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. becomes something that, you know, you want to be able to get them to let, like, to be comfortable in those types of positions. And that all falls under training for treatment. I want my dog to be comfortable with all sorts of weird, crazy things in case I ever actually need it. So smart. This is one of our guys in his little kennel. <laughs> this is Datsun. And then that idea of, you know, muzzle training. And when you muzzle train and get a properly fitted muzzle, so you see how there's all this space in the bottom, the dog should be able to open their mouth so that they can pant. Um, they cool themselves off by panting. So when they're overheating and if a dog is injured or stressed, their body temperature is going to be rising. No different than us when we get stressed. And if they can't open their mouth to be able to pant, you can cause the dog to go into a heat stroke type of situation. They can overheat because they're not able to actually cool themselves down. This is one of my other girls. My This is my my personal dog. This is Miss Chaos. And I love this little one because I'm like, what's wrong with my human? Like I'm dressing her up, I'm carrying her in weird things. And I think most days this is exactly what goes through her mind. Like what is wrong with my human? Why is she doing all of these weird abnormal things? But she will tolerate anything. So in any emergency, I know that I can handle her safely. As I said a few minutes ago, shock is that silent killer. So we can see shock for so many different reasons. It could be blood loss. It can be hypo or hyperthermia, dehydration, broken bones, really any physical trauma can lead to a dog going into shock. Um, as well as the big one, psychological trauma, which people don't often think about. So it might be a car accident, for example, but the dog is not physically injured. The trauma of that could still set their body into shock. So in shock, we see a drop in that blood pressure, which causes the body to not be able to oxygenate properly. And then the organs start to shut down and they'll die. Um, the first things that you'll generally notice is they'll have a poor capillary refill. So if you're checking those vitals and you lift up their gums and you push on their on their gums there and you've got a poor capillary refill, 
I'm going to be concerned that they might be going into shock. You can see hot and cold spots or sometimes feel them on their body. Their body temperature will be dropping and then they'll start to get lethargic. And we call it the silent killer because it can kill a dog for an injury that would never kill a dog. So knowing how to check for this and being able to help them can save their lives. Jen, I'm so shocked to see parasites on that list. Yeah. Parasites can absolutely lead to shock and over too many parasites in their system. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I, I just threw in to kind of, this is a big one that we, we talk about a lot in our first aid classes. Um, this after here is what the stomach should look like, right? So it should be about this size. The before side is a stomach that is bloated. And bloat is one of those things that can happen for unknown reasons. We do know there's things that cause it um, or increase your likelihood of it happening, but it can also happen for unknown reasons. And it is 95% fatal. So, so this is our torsion, which I've never seen a torsion or a bloat on the x-ray with all. And are those gas bubbles? Yes. Amazing. Yeah. So it's a buildup of gas that which descends, just makes that stomach nice and hard to the touch. And it's very, very painful for the dog. And if that stomach rotates, which is the next step that happens, you're now getting blood supply cut off to the stomach. So the organ is starting to die and it's a major surgery and you want to be able to catch the signs of this before you actually have the rotation so that you can get them in to a vet before the rotation actually happens to increase their chances of survival. So this is one of the things that we do teach on in our class on, you know, how to, to recognize some of the signs and symptoms and um, the process of helping your dog as best as you can, but there's not a whole lot you can do other than surgery in these cases. And this dog lived. This one, yeah, this guy lived. Um, dental care, this is another one that uh, people don't realize, but 70% of cats, 80% of dogs have dental disease by the age of three. It is the most common clinical issue treated by veterinarians. And they recommend daily brushing of your pet's teeth to help reduce the damage that we're seeing. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I never brush my cat's teeth. No, <laughs> well, you know, and cats are a little harder. They're not as tolerant as uh, dogs are. That's for sure. Um, I know you had mentioned in your questions too, you know, some of the common emergencies that, that we see. So these are kind of the top five things that people bring their pets in for. So vomiting and diarrhea, which can be a variety of things from disease to parasites to foreign body ingestions. Uh, blunt force traumas, this can be anything from falls to vehicle accidents to just running into things. Breathing difficulties, so choking, respiratory illness, and allergies. Urination problems, which are often urinary tract infections. And then poisoning, so ingesting or via contact. Okay. Uh, another one that a lot of people don't bring their pets in for is the animal attacks. So when pets fight and they scratch each other or bite each other, this is one that for whatever reason, people don't take their pets into the vet for. And these are high infection rates. These are one of the things that if it happens, you should be going into your vet because you need antibiotics. Because if the infection gets too far, you might not be able to get ahead of it. Uh, this is just uh, one of the things that we see popping up nowadays. A lot of people see the social media on this. So xylitol is an artificial sweetener that's being added to a lot of different things. It's extremely toxic to dogs and cats. So check your labels on things when you are going to be giving them to your pet. Um, the number one cause of toxicity is medications. So in North America, for cats or dogs, it's over-the-counter prescription and wrong dosaging. So people using human stuff for, for animals that they shouldn't be using or animals accidentally getting into it or doing the wrong dose on their own medications. 
I've seen that. And I've seen clients, um, vets actually recommend aspirin for dogs. Yep. And you can use aspirin for dogs, not for cats. It is a big no-no for cats. Um, they sometimes will recommend the baby aspirins if they, if you can't get in to get pain meds for your dog, but prolonged use of aspirin will lead to stomach ulcers. Right. So, and, and that's what I was going to say is I had a client call me, my vet told me to do aspirin. My dog is not doing well. And we got the dog off the aspirin and it finally, like they were going to euthanize the dog. I'm like, don't euthanize the dog, take the dog off the aspirin and let's see what happens. And it, it got well, <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, you guys. Yeah. Because the prolonged use of it is a, is a problem. So it's, if they tell you to use it, it's kind of that quick fix, but then you still want to get in and get the proper medication for them, not continue just dosing with human medications. Um, just for fun, these are some of the things that people don't actually always realize are toxic, but aloe plants are toxic for cats and dogs. So we use it on ourselves for like sunburns or burns or things like that. But if your pet actually ingests that it's toxic to them. Yeah. So it's not the inside, it's the it's outside. It's a la LASIK, latex. Yeah on yeah. the outside. So yes, I've seen my sister had cats that were licking water out of the aloe vera plant. And I was like, Holly, that's toxic. But um, the gel it's part the, yeah. is not. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing an increase in pet toxicity with marijuana products. So like edibles and things that people have in their homes nowadays make sure they're keeping them out of their pet's reach because this is something that we are seeing an increase in. And that cat looks so high with those red eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that cat has been doing way too much marijuana. Those <laughs> eyes are red. Yeah. Um, spay and neuter considerations. Cats can reproduce as young as four months old. And uh, farm cats, they just keep repopulating and repopulating, right? So we want to be careful with that. Uh, most dogs are mature enough at nine months to reproduce, but we do need to be aware of adverse effects on their development when we spay or neuter too young because they need those hormones. So that's something that people should really be consulting with their vet and going through their risk assessment to see what is beneficial for their, their pets. Please, please, please microchip your dogs and cats. Um, as you said, I was a police officer with Royal Canadian Mounted Police up here. And I cannot count how many times in my career we had pets turned into the police station or we picked up loose pets. And they might have a tattoo on them, but there is no centralized database for people to look up tattoos. And then with microchips, no um, you want to make sure you're getting your micro check chip checked every single year. So when you go for your annual vet checkup, ask them to scan the microchip because they can sometimes migrate. And if they migrate, they might get missed when being scanned, if they get picked up from being lost. Um, that the other is so smart. What a smart hack that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just a quick scan. And then the other one is updating your own information. Please. Update. That's my fault. When I got my dog, I never updated his information. So when you showed this slide, I was like, oh, darn it. I would call people and be like, hey, I got Fluffy here. And they'll go, uh, we don't have Fluff. We don't own a Fluffy. And I go, okay, is this so-and-so? They're like, nope, we have no idea who that is. Because it's a new phone number or people have moved or you know, I'd have call and people be like, oh, I uh, gave that dog away to so-and-so. And then they give me that person's number and I call them and they're like, oh, I gave that dog away to so-and-so. And I'm playing this chain of trying to find out who actually owns the animal. So update your information. Get the microchip scanned every single year to make sure that it hasn't migrated to a different location. So smart. Okay, that's on my list. On of your, your to-do list? Awesome. <laughs> yes. This is another trend that we're seeing is overweight pets. Okay, so 10% overweight 
will shorten their lifespan by a third. Well, and if you think of a third, that's, that could be, oh, yeah, I mean, that could be years, depending on how long they live. And then the scary trend is 56% of pets are actually overweight. And they classify overweight as 30% over ideal weight. And we only need 10% over for them to have a shortened lifespan. So this is another thing that we are seeing this trend with very overweight pets. And some vets are blunt and they'll tell you your, your pet needs to go on a diet and other ones um, will not. And in discussions with the vets, they've kind of said the reason they don't bring it up all the time is because people will just shut it off and stop listening when they call their pet fat. And if they're there for other reasons, they want to make sure that the pet is getting the care for whatever the ailment is that they're there. So they don't want people to tune out the treatment side. So they'll just not say anything. Whereas we can significantly increase our pets quality of life by keeping them at an ideal weight. Um, so Jen, what is an ideal weight? Well, it's going to vary a little bit, obviously on the size of your pet and um, on their breeds, but for the most part, there's a, I love the little trick and we talk about it in our classes. So like if you take your own hand and you make a fist and I feel my knuckles along the top, this is too skinny. I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel this. If I feel my palm, this is too fleshy. What I should actually feel is the top, if my hand was flat, the top of my fingers, I should be able to feel the ribs, but not see them. So just with like a gentle palpation, I should be able to feel them, but I shouldn't be able to actually see them. And most times now pets have this cushion over top of their ribs and that puts a strain on their entire system. So we see it putting a strain on their liver, on their heart. We're seeing heart um, disease coming up earlier and earlier in pets. And this is one of the contributing factors is this obesity in our pets. So yeah, obesity is linked to heart failure, liver disease, chronic kidney disease, arthritis, bladder urinary tract disease, low thyroid hormone production, diabetes, high blood pressure, and even certain types of cancers. This is just a fun, if you want to see what we sometimes teach people and do in our classes, this is trying to do an eye wrap for a dog. And the training for treatment and getting your dog used to weird and funky things that I can pop this over top of her eye, flip it around and turn her into a pirate. And now I've got her eye out of the light. So if there was a potential, you know, injury or a cut or an ulcer on it, I can put a little padding, wet padding over top of the eye and then do this on top. And she's not going to scratch it or damage it while I'm on my way to the vet clinic. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's the, it's the dog version of the eye donut. Kinda, yeah, a little bit. It's a little different than the horse eye donut, but along the same lines of, you know, protecting that eye so that we can make sure that more damage isn't done while we're getting over to the vet clinic. I've never seen that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, you had um, asked about this. So yes, we are releasing, well, we've just released this new program within canine health and feline health for disaster planning with pets, because we have seen so many evacuations all across North America the last couple of years here, and people are not prepared for it, especially with their pets. And we hear a lot of times that people don't evacuate because they don't want to leave their pets behind, or we see them trying to sneak back into locations to go and get their pets which puts other people, you know, first responders at risk. It also puts vulnerable people at risk because the first responders are now focused on trying to keep people out versus trying to help those in need get out of the location. So we're running our very first class tomorrow night. It's uh, an online two to two and a half hour session 
where we're going to go through everything from understanding evacuation orders to how to shelter in place, pre-planning your evacuations, packing your go bags, training your pet for evacuations, safe handling and transport, what you should be looking at for vet records and health, and then going through a little bit of the first aid side of things in relation to the shock and the stress in emergencies that you're evacuating. That's awesome. And it's all for $30. Yep. It's, it's an introductory price for 30 bucks. I think that's uh, a deal. some of the other programs that we offer. So like our full day, these are our full day courses in first aid. All of the programs are a combination of lecture, interactive and hands-on. You actually get to practice hands-on doing this, a bunch of the different techniques so that we make sure you're comfortable with it. So you can go home and then practice on your own pets. So we've got our basic program. We have one specific to service therapy and emotional support dogs. The advanced program goes into some more extreme things. So if you don't live in an area where you have access to a vet um, quickly, this goes into some more extreme things that you can do to sustain your dog for longer periods of time. And then our working tactical program are, is designed for, you know, police canines, military canines, search and rescue, um, any of our working line type handlers. And then we also have the feline program. We just got the one course on our feline side that uh, is a full day as well, going through emergencies that are specific to cats. And that's my info. Now, what did I miss? Because I know you had some other questions. What did I miss? <laughs> okay, let's quit screen sharing. Yep. And um. I want to know what it was like to be a Mountie. <laughs> I have to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's funny because I never planned on being a police officer. When I went away to university, I was studying criminology, but my plan was to go into the research side. And it's funny because when I was a kid, I wanted to either work in the criminal justice system, not specifically as a police officer, but in the criminal justice system or be a veterinarian. Those were the two things I wanted to be. And uh, I ended up going into criminology because I graduated from high school a year early. I had enough credits to graduate early and my family didn't want me to stick around just to get my one missing science credit to go to veterinary school. So a little bit of pressure that way, but I went and did criminology and ended up getting a summer job in a human smuggling unit with that was your summer job. That was my summer job <laughs> when I was working in a human smuggling unit. Um, and I, you know, transcribed their, their interviews and their interrogations and all of that type of stuff. And uh, then they started giving me some analytical things. So looking at making connections for border crossings versus license plates versus cell conversations between towers. And I was making a lot of connections fairly quickly. So the uh, unit commander started encouraging me to look at policing, which was not something that I'd really considered. But I went and I did the exams just to get him off my back because he wouldn't leave me alone about it. <laughs> and I ended up going through the entire recruitment process and uh, went off for training and still not entirely sure I wanted to do it as a career, but I'm stubborn. So I wanted to see if I could do it and uh, got my very first post out to a little island in British Columbia called Salt Spring Island, where you could drive the whole thing in about 45 minutes and uh, worked general duty policing. So just responding to the regular calls for service and uh, did that for the first four years. And then I transferred into the mounted unit in Ottawa. So that's where I went to the musical ride. And I don't know if, have you ever seen the musical ride? I don't even know what that is. I saw that on your bio and I was like, what is that? Is that like drill team or? It's like a drill team. Yeah, it is one of the most famous drill teams in the world. Um, you have to look it up. It is really cool. Um, it's 
it's amazing to see, but it's an amazing ceremonial unit. And I traveled with them. Um, we did, I did that for four years and then I went back into regular policing duties. So, uh, I actually officially retired, uh, last, well, I guess it's almost two years ago now, August, 2022 is when I, is when I officially retired from the Mounties. And I've now been teaching first aid programs full time and then dog training full time is what I kind of transitioned into from policing. It allows me to have more flexibility in my schedule. So I'm home for my kids a little bit more now and not on the road as much. You are not that old. Like (laughs) I've met you in person. I would have never like to see you sitting at the conference. I would have never understood that you've been through all of this it's just oh, shocking thank you <laughs> you look like you're 20 <laughs> definitely not 20 <laughs> but, but oh thank you I appreciate that yeah I know so did a, an awesome career with the Mounties it was great uh learned a lot a lot of amazing experiences um but now I'm enjoying doing my own thing for for a little while for a little while well, you yeah. are the head instructor for the canine for this Canadian first aid. It's Equa Aid that I know, but you guys call it something different. Yeah, so it's Equa Health Canada and Equa First Aid USA. Um, there, you know, you met Amber, and Amber is the CEO of Equa First Aid, and then uh, Heather, who you met, is the CEO for Equa Health. And then the other companies are the Canine Health Canada International and the Feline Health Canada International. So um, I, yeah, I was awarded top instructor last year in our canine programs. And I actually do all of the instructor training for our instructors on the feline, as well as the um, advanced and working canine programs on that side as well. So when you do a feline class, do you actually have feline that you practice on? I mean, like this could be a scratch factor, right? It could. So (laughs) some of my classes, it depends where I'm going. So I have uh, two cats here at home that are very agreeable and would be happy for people to practice scenarios on nonstop. So if I'm close, (laughs) they can come along with me. If I'm traveling, often we use um, stuffed animals. But oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I was like, how do you do this? This sounds bad. I was teaching in uh, Dawson City up in the Yukon. And one, uh, a couple of the people that were in my class, they had cats that they felt would be very agreeable to scenarios. So I was like, sure. Yeah, you can bring, bring your cat in. And we had their cat in and oh my goodness, the pictures of this cat in class, all bandaged up with like things around its head and its body. And it just laid there and took it all. It was just happy to be, you know, present. So if you've got the right cat for training, we do sometimes have them in classes, but if we don't have access to an agreeable cat, then we absolutely use the stuffed animals so that people are still getting the opportunity to practice the different bandaging techniques. That's awesome. I don't know any cat that would tolerate that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, those of you who have cats, maybe you can host a class for people. (laughs) Now, if people want to become an instructor, is it hard and is it a lucrative career? It is what you make it. So it's one of those things. If you expect everything to fall into your lap, you're probably not going to have a very lucrative career teaching. If you are doing your marketing and you're communicating with people and you're being consistent in your social media, then there is an opportunity to have great success and like I use this now as my full-time income. And it's amazing. Now, are you just Canada or are you international? Like the name says. Yeah, I, I teach across North America myself. Um, so I, last year I came down a couple times, so, um, I'll teach pretty much anywhere if there's enough people to make it worthwhile for me to come because our pricing doesn't change on our programs based on travel it's a flat rate per person so then what we have to do is build in into our minimums and go okay well if my flights are going to cost this much and my hotel is going to cost this much i need to have you know six people in my class just to cover my expenses 
then you figure out what your profit margin is after that in terms of making an income so that you can support, you know, yourself, your family, pay your mortgage and all that side. How many people should be in a class? It really does vary in terms of um, travel. Like I've taught classes that, you know, are local where I don't have to go too far with as little as two people in a class. And then I've had classes with over 40 people. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It can really, it can really vary in terms of the numbers. Um, Not all instructors are comfortable teaching big classes. I've been teaching these types of programs for so long that I'm very comfortable with larger groups and I'm able to fluctuate between my different groups when they're doing their hands-on scenarios. So that way I have a little bit more flexibility. Um, We've got some great instructors down there in the States. Um, that have been getting trained and certified on it. And then if there's anybody who wants to become an instructor, um, take a visit over to the Canine Health uh, Canada and the Feline Health Canada or International. You can punch in Canine Health International as well, and it will bring you to the same website. And click on the Careers tab, and it will bring you to kind of all the information about the cost And the nice thing with the canine and the feline is it's all online learning. So it's self-paced online learning so that you can actually get comfortable with the material, learn the material. You can sit in and watch pre-recorded classes um, that we've done. So you can actually see how the class delivery goes. And then you have to pass an exam before you can be officially certified. certified. Yeah, to turn to turn you loose on people with real dogs and cats <laughs> exactly. and yeah. horses. So you guys, they also have a horse division. Heather, the the creator owner of this whole cool process, actually worked in Saudi Arabia and did this on horses for the Sheik, which I thought was amazing. So they flew her to Saudi, and um. It's a fun story. She quoted him like 20K to do it. And they were like, sure, no problem. And she taught the sheik's grooms how to do first aid on the horses. Maybe the sheik too. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, she goes to Morocco as well to do to work with the canine handlers out there. And they do their working canine first aid programs over in Morocco. So the program is recognized worldwide, which is amazing. And we're seeing more and more need for it. And one of the biggest things, actually, so I was just teaching in uh, Burlington, Ontario last week. And uh, the owner of the facility wasn't there. So he had sent me a message and he goes, my daughter's going to be there today taking care of everything. And uh, I hope it's a good class. So jokingly, at the end of the day, I said to her, I'm like, oh, were you dreading having to sit here all day because your dad told you you had to? And she's like, yeah, actually, I was. And I'm like, oh, oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. (laughs) I hope I didn't make it a bad day for you. She goes, no, it was amazing. It was awesome. She goes, but I was thinking first aid. And when I take my human first aid classes, it's always so boring that I was dreading having to sit through a dog first aid class. She goes, but it was so much fun. So, well, and I have to say when Amber came to my house and gave that class, we had a blast. Yeah, it, it, I would it, highly it, recommend it. And, and I'm interested in taking the dog and cat first data. I don't know the first thing about cat first data other than homeopathy. And I don't know, I've never wrapped a cat ever. It gets creative. Yeah. So the neat thing, like we always in our classes, we teach people how to properly do restraints, right? For their safety, right? So you learn how to properly restrain a cat for your own safety and their comfort, as well as dogs before you even start doing your, your first aid stuff. That's awesome. Jen, um, I know we have um, Charlene on board. Charlene, do you have any questions? And you guys on Facebook, let me know if you have any questions for Jen. Jen, this is so cool. Well, I thank you for having me. It's awesome to be able to share this information with people. And I love the company. Um, I love spending the couple days that I spent with you guys. I have lots of respect for the organization. I think it is really, really needed. And like you said, the fact that 
in California, we have lots of fires. I've helped on some of the fires being a first responder, and I had no training other than what I know holistically as an animal naturopath, and I was a horse trainer. So, so that played in great for horses, but not for dogs and cats, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't, I didn't help with dogs and cats, but sometimes you might have to. Yeah. Especially yeah. in those agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Charlene, nothing. Sorry. I don't have any, because I just did a certification first aid pet certification like a month ago. <laughs> And, awesome. Well, and you did CPR. And so was it a whole just CPR or was it everything? It was everything. It was a CPR and first aid. I knew how to do CPR previously. I actually rescued a dog that drowned in a pool and did CPR and brought her back to life. She wow. had no pulse, no, no breathing and no pulse. Yeah. And so Jen, you teach CPR for dogs and cats. Yep. So it's something we teach in our classes as well. And, you know, I actually have a client, same situation that you just said, Charlene. Um, so she, her own dog fell in the pool and she has a dog boarding facility and she wasn't planning on taking the class originally. She was just going to have her employees take it, but somebody was sick. So she sat in and took it anyway. And not even two weeks later, her own dog fell in the pool, drowned did not have a heartbeat, was not breathing when she pulled it out of the water and having done the course and having just done CPR and it being familiar with, for her, she said she didn't even think about it. She just immediately went into doing CPR and wow. her dog survived. She brought her dog back. That's that, awesome. That is awesome. That's amazing. I did a CPR class probably 10 years ago. I don't remember any of it because I've never had to use it. Like if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. Well, and they do say like people will forget 70 to 75% of what they learn in a program if they're not actually going back and reviewing and using it and practicing what they learn too, right? So we are big on encouraging people to go back and practice it and be familiar with the materials as well, because we don't want people to forget it. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys, thank you. Jen, thank you. I just love everything you do. I'm I'm a fan. So thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, hopefully, hopefully I'll have somebody do a first aid class, um, maybe at my property or host something here or go somewhere else and do it. If you guys are interested in taking the class, put it in the chat. If you want to come to my house, I can organize something and we can do the canine feline class or, or repeat the equine if you're interested. So thank you very much, Jen. Become instructor and then I could be the one to come do the class. There you yeah. go. Go get certified, girl. <laughs> awesome. What's it cost to get certified before we bounce? Uh, with the K9, it is $14.99 for your base program. So that gives you the full day uh, basic first aid, which covers your CPR and your choking. And it's a full day program. It gives you the service dog full day program. It gives you a half day fundamentals, which you can then teach in person or online. So that's one of the programs that we'll teach online. And it gives you a kids program, like which is on dog safety and first aid. And um, then if you want to do the continuing education side of it, there is additional uh, tuition for doing continuing education. So the advanced canines continuing education the um, working canine is continuing education. And we actually have a breeding through puppy raising emergency first aid program that is coming out in April, which is oh, a cool. continuing education program as well. And what does the, if I have you come out to do the first aid course, it's a two day course like the equine? No. So the, well, the basic is the one day and the advanced would be a second day if people wanted to have both of them. And it's 159 per class is what the cost is. That's so reasonable. Well, the manual that you get uh, with it is over 130 pages per class. So you get 130 pages of material in a manual for your basic and you get 130 pages of information for your advanced as well. So you're getting a ton of reference material as well that you get to take home. That's awesome. You guys let me know if you're interested because I am. All right. <laughs>
Have a great night, Jen. Okay. Thank you sure. for being here. And remember, Jen's teaching tomorrow online for $30 and doing like this intro first responder course. So um, jump on that if you want to. Okay. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye.